It is a really great pleasure to introduce Sarah Maitland, who I have admired for a long time, her work. Um, and she's obviously going to read for us tonight and also talk. She is a great talker, one of the greats. Um, she's currently the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Fellow and has the great um, privilege of a little residence in the Nano Naval Centre, which must be heaven. Um, she's in the midst of conducting a workshop there for the Short Story Festival, and after that she'll be at UCC working on the Creative Writing MA. So that'll be a treat for them as well, and all she'll be in Cork for another two months. Sarah has published seven novels and seven story collections, which makes her sound like something out of one of her own stories, <laughs> which use elements of folklore and fairy tale, myths and legends, as well as hard scientific facts, as the occasion demands. She was born in 1960, the second of no, six children. 1950. 50. Yes, of course. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm with them. I'm just probably old. Yeah, 1950, right. That's the only figure in here. Um, and she grew up in London and South West Scotland. She went from a traditional Church of England girls' boarding school to Oxford University in the intellectually exciting year of 1968 to study English. There she discovered, and this is according to her own website, feminism, socialism, Christianity, and friendship, the four elements that she says have become the bedrock of her adult life. She also hung out with some interesting American Rhodes scholars, one of whom happened to be Bill Clinton. You might want to ask her about that later. <laughs> she always knew she wanted to write, and in 1972, correct, Faber published some of her stories in a series called Introductions. Her first novel, Daughter of Jerusalem, won the Somerset Maugham Award in 1978. You're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't born to tell I was, because I'm a genius. <laughs> and since then, she's worked as a writer. She has a monthly column in the tablet and often tributes to BBC Radio and other television and film projects as a kind of consultant and is a tutor on the distance learning MA in creative writing at Lancaster University, which I think is incredibly clever to someone who likes solitude. Um, Sarah is the daughter of an elder of the Scottish Presbyterian Church and for 20 years was the wife of an Anglican vicar. She is now, in her own words, a deeply committed Roman Catholic Christian. In 2007, she built a house in an isolated spot on a wild moor in northern, northern Galloway? Yeah. Okay, um, Scotland, where she lives alone with her border terrier. In 2008, she published what I think is her major work of non-fiction, A Book of Silence. Here it is with a lovely, discreet cover. Um, it's a fusion of poetry, philosophy, theology, memoir, and nature writing a wonderful exploration of the place of silence in the modern age. And it grew out of her various experiences of living alone in remote places. It puts her, I think, at the heart of a new movement of British nature writing as practiced by Roger Deacon, Richard Maybe, and Robert McFarlane. Could you put Kathleen Joan in there? Thank you. Partly because she's just published and partly because she's the best of us. Good. I'm glad to know because I was aware of the lack of female names. Yeah, so Cassie Cassie Janey, Janey, yeah, who is just the best nature writer that we've gotten from the moment. And just published a new collection of essays. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But... That's fine. You know, I was going to go on to say the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> no less, <laughs> called it a serious, important, and deeply engaging book. In my humble opinion, it is more than worthy of the place it holds on my bookshelves beside The Road to Silence by the late Sean Dunn. As well as the novels and stories, 
She has a weekly column in the tablet. Have I just said yeah. that? Sorry about that. Jolly good column, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joan Bakewell called her writing bold and full of challenging ideas. Ideas abound. It is also often quite funny. Gossip from the Forest, this one, which Sarah says is her favourite book of all of them, is explores the cultural links between woodland and fairy tales by visiting specific places, which I think gives it a great heft. While Mosswitch and other stories, which would be my favourite next to the Book of Silence, a Book of Silence, um, is her most recent story collection, and it, it is quite extraordinary. <coughs> it fuses together elements of scientific theory with ancient myth and folktale motifs, and each story is followed by a commentary from somebody from the world of science on its content. It must have been, perhaps later we can talk about putting it together, it must have been amazing. So now, to begin with, Sarah is going to read us a story, and then we will talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, I'm going to read a story which is called Autumn Princess, and I think I'll just read it, and I'll talk about its origin if anyone's interested. So, Autumn Princess. It is not always easy being a postmenopausal princess. And especially not if it's no fault of yours. If you never threw frogs across the room and refused to kiss them. If you never sneered at younger sons nor turned down decent offers from wounded soldiers. If you were never rude to ugly old crones nor cruel to forest animals. If your hair was gold as spring mornings and you brushed it a hundred strokes every night. If your smile was as bright as summer starlight and your heart is pure and merry as wild roses in June, and still no hero turns up to win a kingdom and make you a queen. It's just bad luck. It's bad luck to be the fourth princess in a respectable but undistinguished kingdom, to have a brother so your father is not searching for an heir, and a mother who fails to die in childbirth. <laughs> At the very same time as... Quite by chance, there is a regional excess of princesses and a consequent insufficiency of princes. It's just bad luck to grow up at a time of prosperity and run the good harvests, which leads to a shortage of younger sons out on the road seeking their fortune. It's not your fault, but that doesn't always make it easy. No bless oblige, however. No one ever heard her complain. She made herself useful, working on a wide range of charitable enterprises for the relief of poverty and the protection of the environment. She helped establish a national symphony orchestra and fundraised for the kingdom's art gallery. And when her sister-in-law, the queen, died, she left her charming cottage ornée on the lakeside and moved back into the palace to help her brother, the king, take care of her niece, a golden-haired little princess adored by both the king and the populace. She did an excellent job, loving without indulging the child, making sure she was properly educated and arranging a delightful social life for her among suitable royal families around them. And if, sometimes, as her own golden hair grew thinner and her slender waist grew thicker, if sometimes she wept in the night at the passing of her loveliness and the emptiness of her life, then no one but she ever knew it. Time passed. And then one autumn, as the swallows were gathering for their long journey southwards, as the rowan berries turned shining orange and the sloes turned dusty black, evil rumours began to come down from the northern mountains and the high moors at the furthest borders of the kingdom. And one morning, standing at her window and surveying the world, the princess saw a dark cloud of smoke swelling up over the horizon, and she knew the rumours were true. 
there was a dragon loose in the land. It was some time since this particular kingdom had been infested by a dragon, not in the lifetime of the princess, not in fact in the lifetime of even the oldest citizens, but nonetheless everyone knew exactly what would happen once a dragon had appeared. Dragons on southward migration in the autumn tend to arrive well fed and contented and come to rest in a mountainous and isolated region where apart from breathing out fire for the sheer pleasure of it, and causing the occasional avalanche by the casual lashing of their tails, they do little harm for the first few weeks. But as the days grow shorter and the nights grow colder, they start to feel the pinch, and they become more active and more greedy. And at some point, usually shortly before the first frost, they will take the wing and scour the countryside. They begin devouring, starting with chickens and dogs, then sheep and pigs, then cows and horses, and eventually small children, devouring and devastating. And this dragon ran true to type. Each day its curiously cruciform shape was seen overhead, spouting flames and wreathed in smoke, pressing nearer and nearer to the city. And it did not take people very long to remember precisely how to deal with a rapacious dragon. The princess was too old to act recklessly. She thought about it hard through one long, difficult night. Then, in the morning, she went down the wide stairs and knocked on her brother's office door. Come in, he called. And when she entered, he was sitting at his desk, looking old and tired and bleak. He could see no way of being both a good king and a good father. Your Majesty, she said with a sweet smile, I will need a porphyry. What? He was obviously startled. You know, she said, one of those little horses that with a smooth, angry gait, ideally white. <laughs> She gave, he gave her a blank stare. It's traditional for a princess to ride one when travelling to a dragon slayer. Under the circumstances, I feel I should do this right. You, he queried, and although he tried hard, he could not perfectly suppress the surge of hope that rose to his eyes. Yes, of course, she said calmly. We need a virgin princess. I am the senior princess around here, and as it happens, I am a virgin. Who else? He didn't answer. After a pause, she asked with a delicate irony, You weren't thinking of that trumpery adolescent daughter of yours, were you? What a cheek! <laughs> he didn't argue. He got up, came round the desk, and wrapped her in his arms in a long, close hug. Thank you, he said. Later he asked, will it work, do you think? I can't see why not, she said. Dragons are from the deep magic. They may be wicked, but they don't cheat. The rule book says a virgin princess. It doesn't say new bar, pretty, under age, or even <laughs> sexy. I am an absolutely authentic, 100% high-grade virgin princess. <laughs> I think any dragon have to put up with it. <laughs> At such short notice, they couldn't locate a white porphyry, but they found a very pretty little Palomino pony and decided that it would do. And the next morning, to the grateful, if slightly dubious, cheers of the townsfolk, she rode across the palace courtyard, down the main street, out by the north gate, and headed for the hills. As she left the town behind her, to her right, the mist began to turn dazzling bright and then clear away. The sun rose and the sky was a pure blue with fat white cauliflower clouds. And all day she rode northwards through a perfect autumn, shining with a thousand shades of gold, from the dark brown gold of the bracken to the clear yellow gold of the birch trees, dropping easily like a little coin onto the green grass and the bright red, white-spotted toadstools that flourished there. 
At the day she paused and picked it on blackberries, the juice staining her fingers and chin. She washed and drank from a little stream, cold and fresh, dancing down over stones and moss. And then she remounted her patient little horse and rode it on. It was all fruitfulness and joy for her. And because she had so little in her life to regret leaving, she didn't have to waste any time regretting it. The land began to rise, and by mid-afternoon she'd come out onto the wide moor. She'd come out onto the wide moor where the last of the ling flowed away in purple swathes. In front of her she could see the mountains rising sharply to their lovely jagged profiles, and from deep between the two peaks she could see a small white column of smoke rising in steady puffs, almost straight, until it broke the horizon and blew away eastward, a clear sign of a snoozing dragon. As she climbed the ever steeper mountainside, she could feel her little pony grow increasingly nervous and reluctant. Soon it was balking, sweating, shivering with terror. She slipped off and taking the bridle, a hand firmly against the poor animal's cheek, pressed on upwards, leading it. And after a very short while, she broke out abruptly onto a wide, rocky ledge, framed by a high cliff under the final spike of the mountain summit. Away to the south, far below, basking in the evening sun, was a huge, golden view of the whole kingdom, golden woodland, Golden fields of stubble, golden reed beds along the Silver River, and far, far away, at the very furthest point of her vision, the golden dome of the palace tower. It was lovely and peaceful and rich. It was warm. But she realised the warmth was not just from the sinking sun, and glancing away from the view, she saw the sprawled dragon sleeping along the base of the cliff, the heat of his body adding to the glory of the sunlight. As the dark pewter-coloured pewter scales of his flanks rose and fell with his breathing, they flashed the iridescence of kingfishers on the wing. But along his underbelly and up his neck towards his huge, strong head, the scales were smaller, paler, and had the very sheen of the double strand of pearl that she obviously wore around her neck. The little vulnerable patch of naked skin above his heart was the soft buff colour of a wheat ear's breath. His furled wings, feathered down over his heavy tail, promised all the dreams of flight and freedom, and from his black nostrils a thin stream of white smoke rose steadily up to the blue sky. He was the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most glorious thing she had ever seen. And as she stood there staring, the dragon opened one great yellow eye and fixed his terrible gaze upon her. There was a silent pause, then two sharp flashes of flame erupted, and there was a whoosh of blacker smoke and a huge dark rumbling from deep in his guts that might be rage or it might be mirth. And he said, Oh, seasons of mist and mellow fruitfulness. <laughs> the pony panicked, rearing up and away with a squealing whinny. Taken by surprise, the princess let the bridle be dragged out of her hand and the terrified animal plunged back down the rocky path. She could hear it slithering desperately, crashing against the rocks and hurtling itself away. The evening resounded with the sound of falling stones and the clatter of slipping hooves. But the princess never even turned her head. She stood with her eyes locked onto the gaze of the dragon in a deep and true exchange. As the sounds of the pony's departure faded, she drew a deep breath and with hardly a tremor in her voice said, Oh, do you enjoy Keats's poetry too? <laughs> the dragon laughed with an infinite and ancient hilarity. The gaze beckoned her. Slowly, almost solemnly, she walked across the smooth stone surface of the ledge towards him. Just as she reached out her hand and touched his shining neck, the sun set. And then there was a long, sweet autumnal night 
shot with bright dancing stars. A few days later, someone found a pony, still nervy and exhausted. They caught it and, recognising its royal provenance, led it back to the city. Since the evening of the day the princess had ridden out northwards, there had been no sign of the dragon. Not so much as a wisp of smoke above the distant line of the mountains. So they all knew she had sacrificed herself for them and that her generosity had been accepted. They honoured her with deep and solemn mourning. The Royal National Symphony Orchestra held a gala in her memory. A statue was erected in the centre of the palace courtyard and the people loved their king and their little princess all the more tenderly. But, far away, on a small palm fringe tropical island <laughs> in the huge blue ocean, the princess and the dragon lived joyfully. Each morning she would wake, curled warm against his pearly breast, and think, definitely worth waiting for. <laughs> and when the dragon spread out his enormous wings and took to the air in glory to hunt for their supper, she would stroll down the white sands and bathe in the crystal clear waters, naked and unashamed. And on the rare occasions when she would lament her vanished youth and the frailty of her royal flesh, the dragon would laugh a deep, sexy laugh and say, where are the songs of spring? I where are they? Think not of them. You have your music too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there some context to that story? <coughs> Uh, well, no, as a matter of fact, about my relationship with my local dragon. <laughs> uh, he, he feels it's a bit over-personal, actually. <laughs> it's part of a, a long project, which is how our traditional fairy stories and folk stories tend to eliminate certain sorts of people, including, it has to be said, menopausal women. Um, uh, which seems so. I want to get them kind of reinserted yes. into, into the story. I've actually written a collection of short stories that, uh, that is, is about, it's called On Becoming a Fairy Godmother, and all the women in it are turning 50. Um, and most of them are like that sort of retellings where you take her. There's a woman who's been dumped by her husband and is very miserable, and um, she has the good fortune to find a little mermaid in her. Sink. It's actually in her loo. Um, <laughs> uh, but all is well. It's all while I became a plumber. It's story. So they're all stories to try and reinsert into the world of magic um, women who've been, I think, unfairly eliminated from. Um, yeah. um, they're fun. They're fun to write, actually. You know, um, <laughs> playing with fairy stories, they are the best toy. I like the point you made about old stories. Why make up a new one? Yeah, why make up new ones? That's what the workshop I'm teaching for that. Really I think it's really what it comes down to is I am a very lazy human being. <laughs> uh, and me and Shakespeare, we haven't got a lot in common, Shakespeare and I. But one thing we've got in common is neither of us can be bothered to make up plots. <laughs> plots are really, really difficult to make up. <laughs> Things always go wrong. I have pride, I've written some contemporary novels. But that, it, it, always something goes wrong, you know. Suddenly you've got your character of most persuasively in Wolverhampton. And do you need them in Wolverhampton? No, you don't. <laughs> and you can't just say she's got on a train and went somewhere else. I mean, you, know, you, you have to have motive for all the time, and motive is really boring. Most of the things I do, I don't know why I've done them until after I've done them. The novel depends on people being having these very clear motives. Um, even if they don't know what they're doing, they still are able to make decisions because plot requires decision. So if you use other people's plots, you just say the norms of it. <laughs> At a less frivolous level, which is also God. Stop me if I get boring about this, but. The fictional character with the highest level of name recognition in the world is not Hamlet. It is, in fact, Cinderella. 
That story is 5,000 years old, I think now. You're pushing back trace stories of it. Obviously, she's not called Cinderella in the early Syrian version, but that exactly the same story is there. It's got to be a good story. It's almost got to be a better story than one I make up. Um, sometimes you're making my supper and going to sleep. I mean, just the odds are in its favour. That's so fairy stories, myths, um, folk tales, stuff. Like they're really extremely good material for short stories. I absolutely believe it. And there are lots and lots of them. I'm not going to run out of material. <laughs> so this book. Mosswitch, yes. Uh, Mosswitch, the title story, is amazing. Okay, this, this book is, I was going to say it's not my book, of course it is my book, um, but it's a book that comes out of a collection of stories that an astonishingly good editor called Ra Page, who has a small press called Comma Press, um, which is a very small press, but actually every year, our, probably our biggest short story prize is BBC Short Story Company. Uh, in Britain. Uh, and every year for the last six years, one of Ra's authors has been on the shortlist, which is pretty remarkable, <laughs> actually. Uh, and he's working on a, a new way of generating stories. And because of being lazy, as I've just said, I'm very interested in where else we might find stories. Um, and he puts people together with experts. In this case, they're all scientists, but I've done some stories for them with historians. And then you produce a book with different writers writing short stories which evolve from conversations about expertise. Um, and I mean, this book is about things that before I wrote this thing, I knew absolutely nothing about. There's a story about tectonic plates, um, there's a story about um, bird migration, um, there's a story about um, the uncertainty principles. No, there's a story about the person who invented algorithms. Um, and it was just so much fun to do, you know, because outside people like me, especially if they live up at Batmore and Galloway, don't get to meet cutting edge scientists on a kind of social basis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Logistically put together, did you write the story then meet the scientists? No, um, in, all, in all the cases, I, I, this is the way I wanted to do it. Um, uh, Ra would say, give us a list of scientific subjects you might be interested in. Um, and also, he had some, I would never put any mathematical ones for myself. I didn't know maths was interesting before I wrote this book. Um, and then he said, Oh, well, I don't actually know any bryphologists. That's more, by the way. So I'll go find you one. Which he liked to, and then I met the Moss person or the algorithms person or um, Robin Dunbar, the Robin Dunbar, the Dunbar number person. Do people know about that? Robin Dunbar is a social anthropologist who has particularly looked at friendship groups um, and how they are maintained and why they're evolutionarily a good idea. Um, and as far as he's concerned, it's about the, the growth um, of the neocortex. Um, but he has a Theory that it sort of goes in advance of this that every when our neocortex evolves further, we can have a larger number of friends. Um, and there's this Robin Dunbar number, it's called the Dunbar number, which is 148, um, which is the ideal number of social friends to have in terms of um, evolutionary dynamic. I mean, okay. well, I mean, he also has another theory, which I wrote about in Moss, which, which is that people learn to talk in order to make each other laugh. <laughs> I thought it was just such a wonderful idea when I was up. It's not quite as mad as it sounds. As a group gets bigger, um, group solidarity is maintained by grooming because it releases these um, endorphins. Right? And, but in fact, there is a limit to the number. It takes quite a long time. Monkeys, for example, have to spend an enormous amount of time doing this grooming. Um, and it limits the number, therefore, of friends you can have. Um, because you can't groom 150 people each every day <laughs> and get groomed yourself. So it turns out that laughter produces the same endorphin. So he thinks that we learnt to speak in order to tell jokes. 
in order to make people laugh, so that we could get on with the important business of evolving our man hunting and yeah, stuff like that. Um, I thought this was a fabulous idea. So there was a story about how this poor troop of monkeys, um, nothing funny happens in their lives, so they actually learn to talk, um, to ease up their tensions. Um, so the stories would evolve from just talking to the people. Although actually, to get the best out of them, you have to learn a bit before you go and meet them. Because really, you don't get very far to just walk into their office and sit down and wait for them to give you some gem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. So you read up on that beforehand? I'm usually, at a, yes, at a very basic level. And then I'd meet the people and we'd talk. I mean, all, the, all, these, all these scientists were people who wanted to do it, yes. obviously, so that they were quite interested as well. Um, and after each story, they each wrote an mm -hmm. essay, um, either saying where I got the science wrong. <laughs> <laughs> some of them some of them did. But mostly about what they got out of it. Um, there's one about tectonic plates, um, just about tectonic plates, um, and uh, the... Uh, Scientist that I, I did the story with in her essay said it's a really interesting thing. She, I don't know how much people know about tectonic plates, but essentially there's a, dis, a constructive boundary where the stuff is pouring over hot. So when there's a destructive boundary, which is when a thin new plate bumps into a continental plate. Um, but she said she'd never been interested in, in or never understood what was interesting about destructive plate boundaries until she read my story. Um, she's now writing about it. <laughs> you know, so it was, I hope, I hope they, they got something out of it, but it was such fun. It was partly fun, you know, because mostly they didn't read anything, <laughs> except about destructive place boundary. <laughs> so it was quite, quite expanding for the part of us both. It was really useful in the sense, I'm not likely to be more, uh, the, the, for example, to be taught that the maybe in schools or somewhere where kids can have big science theory as opposed to small science experiment. They need that too. But I, just, yeah, yeah it, was, it was really fun. It's most, one of the most interesting things I've seen. And I got a book out of it, so that's, that's <laughs> And that's fascinating. This, you say, currently is your favourite. Yeah. Forest? Yeah. Um, partly because I'm very interested now increasingly in hybrid text. And there isn't a lot. There's quite a lot of people who have put poetry into novels, but not many people have put non-science, I mean non-fiction and fiction together. And Gossip is really an experiment on that. It's a, um, a pretty well-researched nature book about ancient forest in England and Scotland. Is there a Welsh forest? There ought to be a Welsh forest, but there isn't. I mean, they're all morally to be a Welsh forest. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, <laughs> or rather, I'm not perfect. Um, and they're very site specific. They're absolutely site specific, and that, in a way, is the point. I was very struck by the certain features of Northern European fairy stories that are completely different um, from fairy stories from deserts, and different, interestingly, from Celtic fairy stories. They're seriously different. It's not just the slightly different stories; they're different. Um, I would say the easiest difference to talk about is the fact that in, um, a, a, in Persian and Arabic short stories, there's barely a short story in which somebody doesn't jump on a fly, um, flying carpet or in some other way take off and go somewhere else. No story in the Grimm's books does the human being fly. Um, I mean, that is a massive difference. But actually, if you start thinking about why is that, it's because if you live in a forest, one, you don't need to fly away, you simply hide behind a tree. And secondly, taking off in the undercover of an old deciduous wood is extremely dangerous. <laughs> yeah. You leave on your flying carpet, you say whatever it is it needs to take off, um, and you ram your head into a bunch of twigs. Not good. Um, whereas in deserts, you can see people who are very, very long way away. They have to go very fast if they want to disappear. And they can't run away because they will die. Deserts are very dangerous. They kill people. So clearly what you need is a magic carpet. It's easy. Won't you? So I've got really interested in the sort of site-specificness um, of stories and what the book is actually arguing 
is that how much are the popular uh, Northern European stories are forest stories, how they're affected by having been created in forests. Um, but at the end of each chapter, they said that each chapter is a walk in a particular forest, and they are very particular. The history of the forest in England, particularly, um, our forests had this um, rather peculiar history because they were common land until the Norman Conquest. And then um, William the Conqueror used the French model, which is anywhere a king wanted to hunt belonged to the king. So he afforested, he made into a royal forest. And um, once something is a royal forest, the rules for it change. So, for example, if you live in a royal forest, this is just a stupid example, but if you live in a royal forest, you don't anymore. They managed to change the law in the early 1930s. You have to have the claws taken out of your dog's front feet. That was a law. I don't think it was happening, to be fair, in the 30s, but it was still on the statute book. And that's to stop them hunting, because only the monarchs are allowed to hunt. Whereas if you live in a non-royal forest, you're allowed to hunt. No. So basically the book traces those kind of histories and how that's affected the kind of stories that we get. Um, and I really... So it's got a retelling after each chapter. You, know, you will notice that I like to put things after each chapter. I keep doing it. Um, but I, I find it really interesting and my new book that I'm working on at the moment, which is about migrations, um, also does the same, but it does it with uh, uh, in between each chapter, less fictions from the book of Genesis. Because I'm very interested in why the more uh, dedicated to an Old Testament Christianity, people are the more likely they are to hate migrants. Well, that's very odd. <laughs> I mean, that is very, very odd. The whole of Genesis is about people migrating all over the place. And the other thing that's absolutely fascinating is they have somehow managed to make Abraham into a good guy. Well, if you read that text in the most straightforward way, he's a complete creep. Yeah. So is his wife into prostitution, probably with her consent, I mean, but they did get awfully rich out of it. She flogs, he flogs her to the pharaoh. He lies. They both lie. They say, no, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. You want a bonker? You go ahead, just give me lots of camels. <laughs> And then you have kind of biblical fundamentalists saying, he's so good and so holy. <coughs> what? What? Um, I, I mean, I also do think that uh, whatever you think of God's told you, I've been willing to cut yourself on this road, it's a bit tawdry. Um, but it's even more tawdry when you run around in circles and say, my son, my only son whom I love, when four chapters before you got rid of the other one. <laughs> you send him off in the desert to die. It's also interesting that Abraham's complete failure. He failed to kill either of his sons, despite good efforts. Um, and somehow, in the same way that, in the same way, um, the Odyssey is presented as being this deeply romantic story. Odysseus wants to get home to Penelope. First of all, he's a serial adulterer. And secondly, she isn't much better. But still, then said it really is a story about a lot of home, which is what I think it is. People insist on reading it as a romantic story, and they insist on reading Genesis, or the whole of the Old Testament, really. It's a moral story. So I'm kind of interested in that. Sorry, that's a bit of a um, I'm also very interested in Genesis, because, of course, if you've got somebody called Sarah, your egotism goes with the bunch right. <laughs> I'll just ask one more question then, that's right open. Um, a Book of Silence was published in 2008. Yeah. How do you look at it now? Is it... Oh, there's two different things. How do I look about silence now? Um, I mean, I, the more silent the I you will hear that I love to talk, but one of the reasons why I love to talk is I don't get to do it very often. It <laughs> kind of builds up. Um, I still live in as much silence as I can. I still expect to do so. I'm going to have to think about that because you can't really go on living up a bat more when you're 93. Um, I'm not 93 yet, but I'm dependent on being able to drive, for example, for my lifestyle. Um, I mean, I love the book. How do I feel about the book? I'm a great about the book because the book is what has enabled my lifestyle. It was immensely successful. <laughs> it's made lots of money. <laughs> um, uh, 
I do also think it is quite an interesting book, actually. I think it's a subject that people... How long did it take you to write it? On and off, I suppose. I think most of the things you write, they take you as long as you've been alive, don't they? Mm -hmm. if you know. Do you know what I mean? I think that's a really hard question. Um, how long was it between writing the first word and writing... I knew I was going to write it quite a long time before I started writing it. Um, I don't know, is the answer. I, I, I mean, sorry, I'm not trying to be evasive here. I find it very hard to know when you started, when you yes. finished, <laughs> when you're in the middle. Well, you know when you're in the middle. You're in the middle all the time. Um, but, uh, and you, yeah, it's finished when you start the next book. And I suppose the other question is, is science still as important in your life? Have you moved on? Um, well, I want to pretend it is, but probably it isn't. Um, and one of the reasons why it isn't is I got to be grandmother. Um, it took us some time. Uh, it took my poor daughter particularly some time. Um, I was very unhappy wanting each other in um, and a series of hideous disasters, um, which I uh, won't go into here. Um, but in February, we adopted a baby. Um, and the baby is in America. So, so by the way, are its parents. <laughs> um, and um, I have discovered Skype. I thought Skype was a work of the devil before Zoe was born. And now I know it's an angelic messenger. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, this year I've been less silent. So, even alone, now there's no well, silence. Even when you're alone, even, yeah. it's not necessary. I don't actually Skype with anybody except Zoe. Well, I Skype with my daughter because actually, although she is, of course, the most brilliant child has ever been, if you understand that. She's still not very good at casual conversation and she can't, in fact, work Skype by herself. <laughs> She's so good. So, um, I have had less silence. I did have, I mean, but, but on the other hand, I did 40 silent days in the Sunny Eye Desert last November. Still? Yeah. Um, which Tell was, me about that. How does that work? You're with a group? Well, in this particular case, I wasn't. This was just me and my guide. It's called Sullivan. Um, I go most years, I lead an expedition to explore desert silence um, and have done since the book was published for a, a, a travel company. We didn't go this year, um, which is lucky because I got the job here. We didn't go this year because the Foreign Office are currently. Um, not recommending going to the deep desert. Um, but I went in November, um, sort of with research for the new for the new book. Um, and uh, is it, uh, people have been in a, I mean, a big desert, a real desert, a hardcore desert. It is a very, very strange environment. And it's made more complicated now because of this um, jihadist fear. Um, so, you know, um, so the Bedouin that I've known now for over 10 years are really suffering, um, selling their camels because they can't afford to keep them. Their kids are out of school. How anyone can think you stop people by being, from being a jihadist by making them hungry, it makes me go angry, actually. You, you know, these people, it's marching. It's pretty marching. Um, but it's also the most beautiful. The people who like it, some people don't like it. Some people just don't like it, they don't get it. Um, but for me, desert is the ultimate. And then what you do is you sit in your camel and you wander about and you enjoy the silence. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons why I like desert very much is because actually, if you go with good sense, it's not particularly dangerous. But you do know all the time that you're kind of on the edge, you're vulnerable. Um, if you do something stupid, yeah, you know, as you go for a walk in a nice green field and you get a bit lost, you wander back to the affirm. If you get a bit lost in the desert, you die. So it kind of sharpens your intelligence and attention in a very, to me, interesting way. As well as being very, very um, So, yeah, science is still very important to me, but... 
I don't think I'm using it or doing it very as much as I have done at various times. Which is lucky, because I wouldn't be here, would I? I mean, you know, if I was sitting on top of my moor, um, wishing the sheep would shut up, um, I wouldn't be here. And I'm lucky. I'm going to be really nice down. So, questions? Pat. So, you have a publishing history with Arago Press. I have a... A publishing history with Arago. Yeah. I know you're a lifelong admirer of uh, Angela Carter. Yeah. Jermaine Greer isn't uh, isn't low in your estimation either. You, you have admiration for Jermaine. I, I mean, I'm not probably I have, qualified. Like I, they're different things, if I may say so. I have respect for Jermaine. I, yeah. think he, I think I cannot tell you how much I feel. I don't often feel like my mother. Yeah. I feel like my mother when a bunch of students, no platform, Jermaine Greer. What a bloody... Cheap, you know. Um, she spent all her life saying outrageous things. She knows they're outrageous. She doesn't do any particularly bad things. It made me very, very angry actually that she comes from a particular strand, which is my strand, of the historical movement, and I will not have her put down. But I don't think her writing particularly interesting. <laughs> But what, what, what I was leading up to is that you're somebody who seems to successfully reconcile your feminism with your commitment to Roman Catholicism. And I was wondering, has, has there ever been a strain reconciling those two aspects? Of yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah of course it's a strain. Um, I want to be big tackle here. I'm in the uh, land of Roman Catholics. But, you know, we have a hierarchy that is just so stupid, it's almost unimaginable. Um, I mean, it's just, in one sense, it's just deeply morally good for us to realise even being incredibly holy or being totally thick. <laughs> but they do push it. I know, it makes me really, really angry. I mean, curiously enough, um, I've noticed here a number of priests, and there are a few, and I'm who have actually started using um, inclusive language in their reading of the Mass and the Bible. Well, what? This is, uh, uh, my own post priest in, uh, back in Scotland got formally ticked off um, for using people instead of men. Yeah, this is 2019. That is absolutely insane. And it's also incredibly bad Latin. Because Latin has a very clear distinction between via, which means a male man, and homo, which means a person. So actually what they want to do is to translate a word that means person as man all the time. So yes, I get very cross. Um, but it's little level crossings. It's not deep level crossings. Um, a deep level. When I became a Roman Catholic, I came home and I don't want to be anywhere else and um, I do want to be in receipt of the sacrament. So that, and I love praying. Praying is a really good one. Um, especially within the practice of silence. So, no, I mean, there's no question of one leaving me. I'll tell you what it is I feel about the church. I had a very annoying grandmother. That's how I feel about the church. <laughs> yeah, you can't choose your grandmother. <laughs> you've got the one you've got. As a matter of fact, the church isn't quite as bonkers as my grandmother, but sometimes you wonder. Um, to, to ask about the connection you were talking about, where you were using, you were having a interviewing a scientist, and also you, the, the, the scientist was rather was writing a non-fiction viewpoint on the short story that you had told. Was that when, did Moss come from the idea of the collection, or did Ra... The, the story came out, out before he did Moss, Ra had a whole series of books yes. using this method by a different Moss author. Litmus, right. which, which I Moss contributed which, to actually. Yeah. Moss which came out of one of those collections. Yeah, that actual story, the Mosswood story, the one about Mosses. And okay. then, as I say, it was shortlisted for the BBC Prize, and so he came back to me and said, Would I like to do some more? Could we make a book of them? Um, just because it seems to be working. Um, 
It was, it was a good bit of creative publishing, actually. A lot, a lot of respect for Common Threads. We did some very, very interesting stuff around short story. We don't have as so much of it as we do here. It's a really, I think it's a really interesting idea because somehow putting the two things side by side, you see how wonderful short stories are, and you also see how great facts are. Yeah. You know, to have a, a grist to the mill. I mean, some of the ones that he's that I like best. Um, He's done a number of series on historical events, where you fictionalise from a historical event, working with a historian of the period. Um, we did one year before last um, about protest movements, mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was just good fun. Um, uh, I did a story there about the Peasants' Revolt, which was a 13th century um, Peasants' Revolt, actually. <laughs> um, and it was just really interesting, it was something I was interested in, but didn't know very much about. And, um, you know, it was just fun to talk to a historian about something that interested me. It was, it was, it was good. Um, although, actually, she um, was extremely critical of the story. <laughs> she kept sending it back. No, 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 I haven't got that right. Good for me. Since you were first published, uh, publishing has probably changed a lot, and you were talking about the role that. Well, how the work. Do you think that generally editing has has become like how can you describe how it's changed in terms of how it's related to your work from when you were first published to when you are generally being published now? My publishing history is so peculiar, to be honest, because by sheer gratuitous good luck, I was starting to write at exactly the month in which. Uh, uh, British publishers were looking for the feminist book. They were tired of buying the vast expense of mistakes and thought they generated some cheap ones. And Michelle Roberts and I published our first novel the same day by she was a good friend of mine in my writing group, actually. Well, we were in a writing group together. Um, and we published the book, and which was, I mean, it was a stitch up. The publishers agreed that they were publishing on the same day to maximise the publicity. But the biggest change has been that nobody nowadays gets a commission to write a whole novel and they've never written a novel and they haven't written a word of this one. So, in one sense, it was a, a consequence of the time, um, which was very lucky for me. I'm not not uh, I've, I've been very lucky. I've had mostly extremely good editors. I like the process of being edited. Um, about it. Basically, because I like having attention paid to me, so I'm a real egotist. Um, but having attention paid to work of the kind of good editor pays is an extraordinarily positive experience. Um, um, I don't think that's changed particularly. Um, I mean, what's changed is the time that they've got to put into it. Um, what's changed are the outlets. Um, I mean, it's very, very hard now to publish short stories, to start publishing short stories in the UK um, for patterns of reasons, whereas when I was first publishing, um, at the very end, the sixties and the it was incredibly easy. It wasn't incredibly easy, but it was much easier. Um, you know, because or a lot of just going out for the rest of the magazines and stuff. But I think the attention that a good editor pays um, has been changed. Um, I mean, just occasionally editors do evil and wicked things to you. Uh, my editor for this book and for Book of Silence went off and became a novelist himself. I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was very upsetting to me. Um, it's Max Porter, and he's a great novelist. <laughs> I strongly recommend his novels to you, but it doesn't change the fact that he has no business indulging himself in this stupid activity <laughs> <laughs> instead of being my editor. Uh, <laughs> he may not quite be a that um, I think what's changed, and it, I suppose. I hope this doesn't sound snug, I think it's more historical. Um, it's what's changed is the phenomenal pressure that publishers are suffering from. When I was first writing, 
If you sold two and a half to three thousand copies of a first person's first novel, um, that was good. That was great. Um, that was a success. Now, if you don't sell seven thousand copies in the first four months, it is not a success. It is a failure. Um, but the overheads are really pushing, and um, it makes retention. I think it makes publishers less bold um, because they can't really afford for it to be wrong. Um, and I think that as that's pushed a lot of people into self-publishing, and there are certainly some excellently self-published books. I'm not knocking it, but they're usually not as well edited as they ought to be. Um, or they're often not as well edited as they ought to be. Um, they're often struggling to find some appropriate readership. Um, and they're wasting writers' time, so two different jobs. Um, you know, it's the same as the. Yeah, when you go to the doctor, you don't expect him to give you the tools and say, Did you just inside her? Um, it's not writer's job to sell her. Um, so I think there are. There are but you know something? In the late Roman Empire, they were worried about the future of publishing. <laughs> I don't know a historical period when they haven't been worried. Either people, either the writers are worried because all the publishers are publishing crap, um, in the view of the writers, I mean. Uh, you know, the, the early romantics had a miserable time, except Byron, who had lots of money. Um, it was, you know, um, Publishers are, in fact, as we all know, totally useless. They're sort of useless like dragons. They always are around. They're always devastating and devouring. Um, and we always think it was a better time. Dragon free, or for that matter, publisher free. Well, it's going to be this wonderful publisher. Um, and I just, I don't, I don't know when it ever happened. So I think what you've got to involve it. My brother is a dairy farmer. Um, and he and I have this joke that the selling of milk and the selling of books are identical. Um, you're immensely dependent on horses and externally tallied to yourself. doesn't matter whether you're wonderful to your cows um, or a wonderful writer. Um, there's still going to be external problems that you can't get at. And in neither case do we get paid as much as we think we should be. Um, neither the dairy farmers nor the... Uh, uh, that if you expand, you increase your profitability but lower your pleasure. Yeah, it's difficult to keep a kind of steady, this is my job, so I ought to do it, and this is my joy, so I want to do it, and to keep those kind of steadily balanced through a long working life. Um, but it's got to be better than working on a production line. Um, it's actually now it's probably better than working in the university, frankly. It's a fabulous <laughs> job. When you want to go to Ireland, you will go to Ireland. Here I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I don't want to be privileged about it, but I don't also don't want to kind of canonize the act of being a writer. It's a job for me. It's a positive job, and it's a job which the vocation is not an inappropriate way. But yes, I am my publisher, and the people buying the book, and the bookshop people are all continually stirring their pot to try and stop the money sticking at the bottom and needing to be scrubbed up with wire. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that's what I you know, if you ask my question tomorrow, you won't get very different answers. Mm -hmm. Actually, I've just realised. That's what you're getting to. Okay. Okay. One more question. Eva. Yeah. <coughs> you probably talked about mind shape. So I was just wondering what you're working on in Cork, and it's Cork editing and inspiring and giving you ideas for things you like to write about. Well, I've only been here for a fortnight. <laughs> I'm presently writing a book about, as I said, about migrations in the desert. Um, the circumstances of staying at Nano Nagel House with the astonishing social love that I've been offered by you and by um, Pat and by the whole setup, 
Oh, that's what exactly what writers mean. And yes, I'm pushing ahead with my thought. Yes, it's going to be bloody brilliant. <laughs> no, it's not going to be finished in time, again. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm having too much fun. Um, I, I've never been in the Republic before. Actually, that's not quite true. I did want to go to Dublin overnight to give a lecture at a Eucharistic conference. It was completely horrible experience. <laughs> Uh, partly because the food was rubbish, um, and partly because I won't go into the whole story. I, this was before I was living where I live now. I was living in Wiltshire, actually, uh, Northamptonshire, and uh, um, I was supposed to be doing something in church. I said to the parish priest, I won't be here because I'm speaking at the Eucharistic Conference next Sunday. He said, Shall I help you with your paper? <laughs> <laughs> no, they asked me. It was very, I wasn't very good. Playing in the church there. So I've never been here before. It is an incredibly beautiful country. I'm sure you all know that. And Cork is a fabulous city. Really. And you've got a button museum. <laughs> and me. What? And my, and my son, who's uh, well, wonderful in a lot of ways, obviously, because he's um, to me. But among his other extremely weird hobbies, you see, he has a great fondness for bizarre museums. Um, he's the only person I know who's ever been to the Stalin Museum in Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> went all the way to Croatia to find out where he found the Stalin Museum. So I said, I've got this great, I've got this great fellowship, I'm going to call. And it's really exciting. And did he say congratulations, Mummy? No, he didn't. He said, You must go to the Butter Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has been to the Butter Museum? Oh great! That's really good. I thought the Butter Museum was fat. <laughs> Many I'm very interested in old butter roads because um, my son, having heard about this, my son is a professional donkey tracker. He has a donkey called Martin. And he and Martin go for long walks together. Um, uh, last summer they walked all the way from the top of Scotland to Weymouth, um, collecting lighthouses. But he and I now have a theory that Kerry Gold would just sponsor him sponsored Martin to come and reward the butter rules because they're coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get extra and stuff. So yes, I'm very interested in butter rules. <laughs> but I can't I haven't yet worked out how to make them into non realist short stories. It will happen. It will happen. <laughs> Thank you very much.